Amen. Well, the Lord uh, directed me a little bit different this morning, um, and I wanted to share with you uh, a message. Uh, there's no PowerPoint this morning, but there is a live event. If you have the uh, YouVersion Bible app, you make sure that you have that. Um, no other Bible app will suffice. It is the YouVersion Bible app. Search live events, and you'll see a message entitled, God's Temple. I want to read just a few verses today out of 1 Corinthians. We had been uh, working through that for a little while, the beginning part of the summer, and the Lord brought me back to a few verses that I had previously studied, and I would like for you to stand with us as we get into God's Word, and we just read just a few verses beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, and then going over to chapter 6. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 out of the NIV, verse 16 says, Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? And then over in chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much once again for the privilege to be together in this place, O oh God, to be the house of God, not to assemble in the house of God, but to be the house of God, as Paul clearly teaches here in these few chapters. God, we ask you today that you would just release the power of your written word into our lives. And once again, we ask you to help us to apply the word of truth to our lives as we leave this place today, as we go about our life on a daily basis. May your word affect everything that we do. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 16, this is Jesus speaking after having a conversation with his disciples and challenging them. Peter comes up with the answer that, that Jesus was looking for, that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said this in Matthew 16, verse 18, the latter part of that. He said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it Jesus said I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it some translations use the word prevail against it I will tell you today that the devil will certainly try to overwhelm and overcome the church we are the church Mount Morris Gospel Tabernacle, this building, this facility is not the church. Those of us sitting in these pews today, we are the church. We are God's temple. We are the body of Christ. I mean, no disrespect to this beautiful facility that many sacrificed and gave and, and uh, helped to build this beautiful place that we worship in, but we are God's temple people that are gathered here today. The devil will try. He'll do everything that he possibly can to bring attack upon attack against the church, against you, against every member of this church, against the leadership of this church. He will do all that he can. But Jesus' promise to us was that the devil would not prevail. He would not prevail he would not have the victory. The word prevail in the Greek means to overcome or to be superior in strength. I have news for you. Although the onslaught of the enemy, the outright attacks of the enemy, the blatant disregard for God's people will not prevail. It may seem like they are strong attacks, but they are not superior to God's strength. Do you understand that today? They are not superior to God's strength. Satan will not overcome. He will not be victorious. 
in any way, shape, or form when God's people are completely sold out to Him. Jesus, of course, in talking about the church and building His church, He was not talking about a magnificent building like like the temple that stood in Jerusalem. Jesus, of course, meant people. He meant those who would eventually follow Him. You know, the remarkable thing about the church is that it is a living, growing organism. It's, it's not a building made with concrete and mortar, bricks, steel. The church is a living, growing organism. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells us, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That describes us. We are the living stones. We must be flexible. We must allow the Spirit of God to mold us and shape us. We, we must not take on a hard form, a fixed form, where we, we are not pliable at all. We must allow ourselves to be pliable in the Master's hands. In fact, the word for the church in the Greek, ekklesia, it it really stands for a gathering of people and, and not a building. When Jesus mentioned the church here in Matthew 16, he was not referring to a building. You know, through the years I've... I've heard people say things they've had, you know, they have such high regard, it seems, for the church. And maybe you've heard people say things like, oh man, you can't do that or you can't say that, you're in church. You ever hear somebody say that? When in actuality, we are the church. I mean, it's very admirable for people to have uh, respect for the building. You know, I've over the years, I've heard people say, you know, don't run in church and this and that. You know, my problem with kids running in church is I've seen kids come around the corner running in church and they smack into something or smack into somebody else. I, I mean, no disrespect in any way, shape, or form. But we have to have high regard for the church, the people people who have been shaped and molded by God's grace. And I don't know about you, but I am very thankful for God's grace and God's mercy. I am very thankful that I don't stand before man for judgment, but that I stand before God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul clearly points that out as a leader. He meant no disrespect to man, but he realized that he stood before God, that he needed to be accountable to God and God alone. Now, in the Old Testament, the Old Dispensation, the tabernacle, and later on the temple, they were given entirely to God for God's use, for sacred purposes. They were held in high regard, these, both of these facilities, But Acts chapter 17, verse 24, reminds us that the rules have changed in the New Testament era. It tells us this in Acts 17, 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. We understand that God did at one point dwell in a building made by the hands of man beautifully crafted, beautifully constructed according to the word of God himself. In the Old Testament, I heard it put this way one time, in the Old Testament, the Lord had a temple for his people. However, in the New Testament, he has a people as a temple. Turn to the person next to you and remind them that you are a temple. Tell them, you're a temple. Now, in Scripture, as I began to kind of ponder over these few verses that I I want to share, just a little bit of explanation with these two verses, these two main Scripture texts, there is uh, 
a tremendous comparison between the Old Testament temple and the New Testament believer who God has called us to be. And, and I want to share a few of those comparisons, a few of those illustrations this morning. And, and I want to share with you today how they, how they truly apply to us today. What kind of people we ought to be. Number one, if you're taking notes, if not, it is still uh, in the live event this morning. Number one, the temple was a place where God's presence was. The temple in the Old Testament was the one place where you could find God's presence. You know, today, I believe we can find God's presence anywhere. God's presence isn't just contained inside of a building. And you, and you want to know why that is? It's because God has given us the responsibility of carrying His presence. We are the temple. We are the ones who, who contain God's presence. And it should not be contained. It should influence everyone around us. I love... The, the explanation of Solomon when he completed the temple. It tells us in, in 1 Kings chapter 8, it's also uh, in, in 1 Chronicles as well, but in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it tells us when the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their sacrifices because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Just imagine with me for a moment the glory cloud of God filling that temple. The, the sacrifices that were offered on that day were just simply unnumbered. The priests stood all day making sacrifice before God. And when they put the, the, the Ark of the Covenant into the most holy place and, and God was pleased with what was built for him, that the glory of God came and filled that place. That tells me something. That in order for God's glory to come and fill this place, fill each and every one of us, God must be pleased. Now I know in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, those two verses that I read, that Paul clearly points out that our physical bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And yes, it does indicate that we must take care of our physical bodies. That not only in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, in a, in a moral sense, we must take care of our physical bodies. Paul had just addressed in chapter 6 sexual immorality that was going on in the Corinthian church. Not, not in the city of Corinth, although it was going on there. That's where they learned it from. But in the Corinthian church, he had just addressed that. I, I believe in the Old Testament, the temple was a place of consecration. Nothing defiled was allowed on the grounds of the temple. Nothing. But yet in the New Testament church, we have lowered our guard personally. Each and every one of us are responsible for our own actions. As I shared last week in conclusion, if we want to see revival in our churches and in our nation, we must be responsible for ourselves. I share the illustration of the piece of chalk that the evangelist, uh, a gentleman came up to an evangelist at the end of the service and said, you know, what, what do we need to do to have revival? And he told him, take a piece of chalk and draw a circle in your private place of prayer and get inside of that circle and ask God to bring revival to everything inside of that circle. Revival speaks to the church. Not the world. Something has to be alive in order for it to be revived. It had to have been alive. It had to have received Christ at some point in order for it to be revived. We have lowered our guard. You see, the New Testament believers, we are responsible. We have the opportunity to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. 
As a Pentecostal spirit-filled church, we believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We believe that when God is pleased with a servant of the Lord, that he has promised to fill them with the baptism in the Holy Spirit and with power to be an effective witness for him. That's what we believe. The New Testament believer has the opportunity to have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. The divine presence of God. And that means that God desires to use us to reconcile the world to himself. We have taken up the cross of Jesus Christ, as Paul said. It is time for us on a daily basis to pick up our own cross and follow after Jesus Christ. Now the work of the cross is done. Salvation was paid for by the cross of Jesus Christ. But we must pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. It's a good place to say amen. amen. Romans chapter 8 tells us this in verses 9 and 10. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of God is living within us, then there is a change in our lives. We allow the Spirit of God to consecrate us for God's purpose. Consecrated things in the Old Testament were deemed pure for noble purpose, for the use of God. They were used for sacred purposes. I want to remind you today that just like those items in the Old Testament were used for sacred purposes. God desires to use each and every one of us for sacred, holy purposes. To be a place where God's Spirit dwells. And I love the promise of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. And it tells us this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How many of you today, you want to see God? I'm not just talking about in this place or in this room or even so much in this church, but in your own lives. You want to experience the presence of God on a daily basis. How many of you want to experience God walking with you, directing you, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's presence is with you every step of your day? How many of you would say amen to that? That's what God desires. We are God's temple. Not this place. But it's because we have gathered together that God's presence is in this place. And we must hold in high regard the sacredness of that. We treat the things of God with contempt. We treat the grace of God as something disposable or something that we can just continually use at our own disposal day after day to give us an excuse. But I believe God is calling us to a deeper purpose. If you're taking notes, the second comparison that I have found between the Old Testament tabernacle and temple and the New Testament temple is this. The temple was a place where men gathered to pray, to worship, and to study. The Jewish temple was referred to as a house of prayer. In fact, Jesus said so in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. And no, he was not talking about the New Testament church at the time. I have also oftentimes misquoted that. I believe God's house should be a house of prayer, but not so much necessarily this place, this building, but us. We should be a house of prayer. Jesus said in Matthew 21, 13, it is written, he's referring to the Old Testament. It is written, he said, 
My house will be called a house of prayer. And then he went on to say, but you're making it a den of robbers. That's another sermon for another time. But I want to focus on the fact that Jesus said that his house, the temple, the tabernacle, was a house of prayer. A house where the priests came and offered prayer and sacrifice for the people of God. But Jesus changed the rules. And he said now as the temple of God that we are the house of prayer. Lots of stuff happened in the, in the temple. Songs were sung. Sacrifices, of course, you know, the Bible tells us that day and night the priests offered sacrifices. In fact, their job was never done. There was not even a chair in the chamber where the priests offered sacrifices. Why? Because the work was never done. They had offered sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Prayers were prayed. Songs were sung. The word of God was proclaimed. All of that was done to glorify the name of God. To magnify the name of God. Church, we are now the temple. We're the temple where there should be prayer. There should be worship. There should be the study of God's word. Not to mention purity in our hearts. Because God's presence wants to dwell here, wants to dwell within our life. Why? Because God must be magnified. Not man, not, not anything we can do or have done, but God must be magnified in everything. In this place, through God's temple sitting before me today, I want God to be honored, glorified, and magnified through our lives. That when we gather together to pray and to seek God and to worship Him, that God is honored in our lives. And the only one that knows that for sure is you, is me. We must lay our hearts bare before God and let God deal with our hearts. In fact, the New Testament tells us in Romans chapter 12 that literally our bodies are to be living sacrifices. God no longer delights in the animal sacrificial system, but He desires for us to willingly come before Him and offer our very lives as a living sacrifice. Turn to somebody next to you and say, God wants you alive. First of all, He wants you awake. Come on, slap Him him right on the leg there. And secondly, he wants you alive. He wants you to be a living sacrifice. Living things do things. They work. They're functional. They're not just dead carcasses laying on the ground. They do God's bidding. We've got to yield our entire life to God as a sacrifice. How do we do that? Galatians chapter 5 tells us. Galatians 5 tells us this. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. You are not to do whatever you want, but you are surrendered to God. We must allow the Spirit of God to speak to us, to direct us. It is a battle even without the Spirit of God to do the opposite of what your flesh is telling you to do. How many of you have ever experienced that? I mean, it's a battle without the Holy Spirit of God directing you our natural human impulse is to do what we crave to do what we desire a great atrocity has been done in our society and and generations uh, are being told to do what makes you feel good if you feel like that's how you've been created or or what you, you know what's been put inside of you go ahead and do it But let me remind you that the heart of man is contrary to the heart of God. It always has been and it always will be. It is something we must battle against. 
and we need the Holy Spirit of God to help us. The Spirit helps us to do what is contrary to what our flesh is telling us to do. Thirdly, if you're taking notes, is this. The temple was a place where they carried out their duty, the duty that they had been given by the Lord. Each individual had certain duties, and I, you know, the press, uh, the priests had their duties, and, and so on and so forth. Each individual had a certain task that they were given by God to do. In the Old Testament, duty is what one ought to do. The root meaning of that word is to owe, to, uh, to do what is due, something that they felt obligated to do. You know what? Life itself is an absolute privilege. To be able to wake up every day and to have the breath of life is a privilege, isn't it? It's a privilege offered by our Creator, God. I believe firmly that that is where all life has come from, from the Creator God. He has breathed life into us. It is a privilege. Therefore, it is one's debt to live their life to glorify God. But here's the thing. That is still contrary to the flesh. The flesh tells us we should do what we want to do. We should get up every morning. We have the right to please ourselves, to do whatever we want to do. And you know what? There is certain truth to that if you're listening to the flesh. But the Spirit tells us that we are obligated to God because of not only the fact that He has created us, but that He's redeemed us. And we are obligated to God as His servants to glorify Him. Duty deals with the heart motives, the purpose for living. It includes the responsibility to discover our personal assets, the gifts, the abilities, the talents that God has given us and utilize them for God and for His glory. This commitment demonstrates character. When a person realizes their commitment to God, that God not only was the creator of their life, but God was the one who redeemed their life straight from the pit of hell, that they realize that out of godly character, genuine character, that they owe this to God. And what develops there? Goodness, uprightness, personal integrity, honesty, morality. We choose to live this way because we realize all that God has done in our life. It's a good place to say amen. We choose to live that way because of that. But why duty to God? To get the answer, we've got to consider the opposite. The opposite of genuine godly character. And the opposite of that is this. The obvious result in society becomes selfishness, self-centeredness, rebellion, absolute chaos and anarchy. That's what society will lead to. If everybody just does as they please, does as their, their moral compass inside of them tells them to do, it will end in absolute chaos in our world today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, just a few verses before I, I had read the scripture text, verses 19 and 20, I said that Paul was dealing with the problems of sexual immorality in the church, and this is where it stemmed from. Because they were not allowing God's word to govern them, they were allowing their own hearts to govern them, this is what happened. And Paul directly quotes them. In verse 12, he says, some of you say, I have the right to do anything. I, I, I really, I have the right to do anything. You know what? There's a lot of truth to that. You do have the right to do anything, but that doesn't make it right. Paul said, you have the right to do anything, but that doesn't make it beneficial, does it now? You can do whatever you want. You can go any direction you want, but it doesn't make it beneficial. And he quotes them again. It says this, you say, I have the right to do anything. 
but I will not be mastered by anything. You know what most drug addicts say? Until they get to the point where they are in absolute desperation, they say, I got this. This doesn't master me. I can control this. I can stop any drug addict, alcoholic. I can stop at any moment. If I want to, I can just stop. But Paul realized that when we give in to the flesh, when we gratify the, the flesh, that becomes our master. The Lord no longer is our master, but the things of this world master us. This was a saying in the Corinthian church in, in the city of Corinth, but it infected the Corinthian church. I can really do whatever I want, but I want to remind you again that in the Old Testament temple, people considered it their obligation to honor God, to give to the Lord, and to serve the Lord with whatever talents and abilities God had given them. And we must get back to that. Ecclesiastes ends in chapter 12 with these couple of verses. It tells us this, Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every, everything deep into judgment or every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Ecclesiastes, a book of wisdom, sums it up that way, that it all comes down to this. Fear God, which means respect and honor God, and keep His commands. Keep His commands. I shared just, uh, I think, last week on Wednesday night, I remember... Um, Early on in my pastorate in Central City, we, it was a graduate Sunday, and I was sharing a message on, on how to honor God, just simple ways to honor God with our life. And there were several students there. There were a few there that I, that I didn't even know. And I got to the point where one of the simplest ways we can honor God is by obeying the law, obeying the law. And as soon as I got those words out of my mouth, a police officer came through the back door of the sanctuary to arrest one of those students who had disobeyed the law. Needless to say, the service was pretty much over, but the point was made. <laughs> Obey the law, or else there will be consequences. Worship team, would you come back as we begin to conclude our service? Ephesians chapter 6 tells us this. It tells us that basically every job, every occupation, every work, I mean, it talks about the slaves and how they were to treat, uh, how they were to work for their masters, that everyone, that it was their sacred responsibility to do their best. Ephesians 6, verse 7 says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. I read that verse several times this morning and I thought to myself, isn't it a shame that Paul had to remind the Ephesian church that in everything they did, that they ought to regard it this way, that everything that they did, they should do it as if they were serving the Lord. How many of you here today, you think to yourself, that should be common sense? Anybody? That everything that we do, we should do to honor God. Everything. Every task that we take on. Because if we don't view it that way, we might tend to view it as, you know, the pay that's coming to me, it's, it's due to me. Or, you know, I'm not, tr I'm not being treated very fairly, so I I'm not going to give my best today. My boss is a difficult person to work for. I'm, I'm just going to make sure I just get by. I'm just going to do the bare minimum. But might I remind you that we are God's temples? Responsible for taking God's presence to a world that so desperately needs godly people to live upright lives. The last thing that I saw when 
thinking about the temple was this. When the people saw the temple in Jerusalem, it reminded them of the powerful name and glory of God. The temple was a magnificent reminder of the place that contained God's presence. Even to the Romans around the temple in Jerusalem, they had heard story after story about the God of the Israelites. It was a magnificent reminder of the power and glory and majesty of God. Paul wrote this to the Corinthians in the second book of Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. He said, You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. We are God's letter to this world. We are called to be God's temple. A place where God is supposed to dwell. A place where God is supposed to be worshipped. Where God is supposed to be prayed to. A place where we each carry out our responsibilities and serve not only in, in, in the body of Christ, but in our local community and in our jobs as if we are serving the Lord every moment of every day. Paul is telling us everywhere we turn, everywhere we go, we are living, breathing love letters to lost humanity. That's who we are. That's what God has purposed for us to be. Together, we make God's united temple. 1 Corinthians 3, our scripture text tells us that. God dwells in our midst when that happens. Would you stand with us? In conclusion, I just want to share a couple of questions with you. It's still early. I'd like for you to take an opportunity to respond as our worship team will lead us in just a few moments. My question to you is this. How are you treating the house of God? Not not this place, not this building. But how are you treating the house of God? Your temple. Are you totally dedicated, committed to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is there something today that God is speaking to you about? That you just simply need to give to God crucify the flesh and say God I want to be your temple is your life a pleasing display of God to this world we're going to sing this song chorus says simply God I give you my heart I give you my heart I give you my soul I give everything to you. Every breath that I take, every moment that I'm awake, I give to you. And as we do so, I want you to take a few moments to respond to God's word. I want to challenge you. If God is speaking deeply to your heart to find a place around the altar. I remind you again that the New Testament altar should be an altar where we present living sacrifices. And in order to live the life that God intends for us to live, we need to crucify the flesh a little more every single day and become God's temple. I hope that that's your heart today. Let's sing this song before we close our time together.
If you want to come to the altar and respond, we invite you to come. If you need prayer for anything this morning, we invite you to come. And we will pray with you. Let's sing this together.